Welcome back to Travolta, covering Lonely Hearts. Enjoy the episode. Hi, Jeff. The year was 1945. Oh, oh, here we go. I was on the trail of them two killers. The Lonely Hearts killers. And then I got them. We, and, they went. And, I thought, and I thought to myself. They deserve to die. How do I feel about that? They, they deserved it. Yeah, folks, we pretty much just recapped the entire plot of the film uh, Lonely Hearts for you all. Thank you for listening. Please remember to <laughs> rate, review, subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, uh... By the way, this is the first episode we're recording in the new year. Yeah, this is our first uh, 2022. It's not the first episode you folks are listening to in 2022. Sure, but it is right. the first uh, 2022 recording. Happy yes. New Year, folks. Happy New Year, Stuart. Happy New Year, Jeff. See, the first 2022 episode will be Be Cool. Be cool which right. you folks will get two days after we're recording. This is a little inside scoop. Yeah. And you are, will be introduced to everyone's favorite person, Raji, as the, as the first recording of tw- of the first episode of 2022. Yeah, by the time they listen to this now, they've heard Raji, about Raji. About Raji. <laughs> oh, uh, Raji. Vince Vaughn has not been seen since. Uh, canceled. <laughs> Violation of the Geneva Convention. Yes, illegal performance. Uh, so this takes place um, after Be Cool, after Magnificent Desolation. Yes. So we're jumping in to that point in Travolta's career. Um, he's pretty much, he's on the lower end of the wrong side of the mountain. If yes. we're describing his career with a mountain allegory we've been working with. A hundred percent. Where he's on the downward slope. He hasn't hit rock bottom yet. He's getting he, there though. But he's near the bottom. Everything he's been trying recently has failed. Uh, Battlefield Earth Onward has been a series of flops, failures. Yeah. Some on a personal level, like his performance was terrible. Some on, um, just the movie was bad. Some were good movies, but didn't have box office success and they're all movies he tried yes these are all like real attempts that he's making he's not really phoning it in yeah he's been trying and punching in every direction and nothing's working right now this i would say jeff if you might agree this i wouldn't call a rebound movie Mm. Because it's he's not really revisiting something he's done. And yeah. Let's not think about Chains of Gold here for a second. Because <laughs> uh, I was thinking this too. Like, oh, this kind of is like Chains of Gold. But let's let's erase Chains of Gold for, yeah. a, for a moment. As the the recorder did when we did that episode. <laughs> it literally erased the episode. <laughs> good callback, good uh. callback. Um, but so just imagine that movie doesn't exist, and, which it doesn't. <laughs> it literally uh, doesn't. We're the only people to have ever seen it. This isn't something he's really done before. Mm-hmm. Which is surprising, isn't it? It's the first time he's done... True, uh, heavy, tra- crime, drama, gangster. Yeah, and he hasn't really done many period films in his career. Right. Uh, he's done a few. I'm trying to think. How, how many has he done? Well, he did Grease is a period. Grease is a period picture, but at that point, only like 20 years period. It wasn't like a period picture. Right, this quote, is unquote. 2006, even in the 1940s. I'm scrolling, I'm scrolling through all the movies he's done right now, see if I can find any like real period pictures and there aren't basements many basements the dumb waiter maybe yeah i mean that uh, is, i know right it? i know is i know it? it's like that's hard to call that one a period piece too yeah no i th- really don't think he's done many if any period pictures but like i just looked up because this seems to me like uh i found his one other period picture the what thin, the thin red uh, line <laughs> what has been working for other actors type of project meaning mm-hmm. Uh, cause I just looked up like best two thousands, uh, crime dramas or gangster mm-hmm. movies. And like, this is around the time that like gangster movies are kind of having a resurgence. They're having a little bit of a comeback. Yeah, they are. Um, I would say like the nineties was a really good comeback for gangster movies. And yeah. this is sort of like the tail end of that comeback, but yeah. there's still a lot of, it's a little different. You know, one thing I thought well, of was road to perdition. Mm-hmm. This seems like. Tom, uh, um, John Travolta is like this. We had just flopped from Be Cool, right? Yeah. And he's like, like, come on, guys. Like, nothing's working for me. What yeah. can I do here? Mm. And he's like sitting in his mansion thinking about this. And all of a sudden he flips a channel and it's Tom Hanks. On Road to Perdition. The guy from Philadelphia? Yeah. The guy from Forrest Gump? The guy from like all these other movies? But he's a gangster? Mm-hmm. How'd they do that to Tom Hanks? But you know what? Good movie. Good movie. It worked. And that is, 
inherently where, you know, when you're saying gangster movies are having to come back, the difference between this period and the 90s period is the 90s is very much like a modern crime movie resurgence. Whereas this... Like, this was, like, in the 90s, right. it was films like Goodfellas, Heat, that were, you know, kind of reckoning with the latter end of the 20th century. Yeah. Um, whereas in this the is early 2000s, back. we're jumping back about 100 years. You yeah. know, we're having Road to Perdition, this, Public Enemies. Yeah. A lot right. of people are finding a newfound interest in the like, 1940s gangster, gangsters. gangster culture. Yeah. Like your Al Capones and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, not something he's done before, mm-hmm. but something that you can look at from afar and be like, this seems to be a trend that's working. Yeah. So, I should hop on that. Mm hmm. And I mean, it's it's a popular trend at the time. And when you, you sync up the cast that's in this movie, oh my god, this is a great cast for a, a period drama gangster film. It is. I mean, you got the Gandolfini. Yeah, you got James James Gandolfini. Surprisingly, I'm actually surprised he's not top billed over Travolta in this, because Travolta might be quote unquote the bigger star, movie star. But like James Gandolfini in a gangster movie, right? This is a yeah. This is more of a James Gandolfini. Right, here's here's something I'm gonna say right now. James Gandolfini is the only person in this movie who's playing a character, uh, <laughs> and even he's like barely playing a character. Yeah. Everyone else is kind of just playing an archetype. Yeah. But we'll go back to that. No. Yeah. I I agree with that. I agree with that 100. percent Yeah. But I think the problem with this movie is that. Uh, unlike, you know, your Road to Perditions, which are directed by Sam Mendes, or your Public Enemies, which Michael Mann did. This is directed by Todd Robinson. You, you said earlier you, you think the number one problem in this movie, and then you mentioned a director. Yes. Is he the number one problem in this movie, Jeff? Yes. <laughs> that is what I was getting at. Copy that. <laughs> well, I was saying that um, the problem is that there were those other movies around this time were directed by great directors. Like Michael Mann and Sam Mendes, some of the Whatever your personal thoughts on them, they are some of like the top directors of the time. Was Sam Mendes has proven back then though? He had done American Beauty at that point. Okay, he's proven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which uh, doesn't really hold up now for obvious reasons. Well, yeah, but I mean, for Seeing the time as it's being, about like a child predator played by Kevin Spacey. Well, yeah, um, but um, in the time being now, it's like yeah, yeah that, that it was a solid hit. Yes, won the Oscar. Um, but Todd Robinson, the director of this film. Uh, had at this point, here's his here's his repertoire of directorial films: uh, The Legend of Billy the Kid, as a documentary; The Four Diamonds; Wild Bill, Hollywood Maverick; White Squall; Amargosa; Go Tigers; and then he does this. All documentaries. Pretty much all documentaries. Yeah. And I don't mean to like immediately discredit a filmmaker because i think a great filmmaker can come from anywhere but we've been down this road before yes where it's the it's the ratatouille thing of like a great filmmaker can come from everywhere but not everyone can be a great filmmaker of course um and so he he doesn't uh uh he's he doesn't really have the bone of fetus the bona fides however you say the word <laughs> but great to bring back that little bona fide bit. and like he, he had won <laughs> multiple awards for his documentary pictures so he ha- he's a proven documentarian filmmaker and it's not too out- outrageous to think of like you know he gets in the room with some people he's just won some awards from documentaries and he's like what do you think you want to do next like mm-hmm. well i really want to get into feature filmmaking yeah Oh, really? It's like, what's your idea? It's like, well, I have this gangster movie. Oh, you know what? Yeah. I work for Paramount, and we really want to finance yeah. some like 1940s gangster. gangster movies. But I think Robinson's career in documentary work yeah. is a fault of this movie. Because this movie yeah. struggles to find an emotional backbone. It struggles to find character moments. Yeah. Instead, it just feels like, all right, here's the notes. Here is what happened. Well, and... For a fact for the audience to know that yes. Todd Robinson, um, the director, the main John Travolta plays a detective in this movie called Elmer Robinson. Yes. And that is and yes, you may think, well, there's plenty of Robinsons who aren't mm. closely related, right? Well, I'm here to tell you that Elmer Robinson in the story is the grandfather of Todd, Todd Robinson, Robinson, the director. And whose dad, Ed Robinson, is a character in this movie. 
Yes. So talk about the whole problem of being too close to it. Mm -hmm. I feel like, and I agree with you on that, that I think that is probably the number one problem in this movie as well, is this director feels like he's too close to the story in the sense that he can't let any dramatic sort of wiggle room yeah. in it. It like has he, to all happen and according to plan. And he has a very clear emotional connection to this material. Absolutely. From what you're saying. But it, he never uses that. Like the, the, clear, the clear attempt of this movie is that he's using the crime as a way of, you know, developing this, this relationship between his father and his grandfather. Right. Which is supposed to, I'm sure, echo his own relationship with his father. Yeah. But that be, that becomes such a side plot by the end of this movie. Yeah. And it, the movie just feels too focused on, all right, so we're investigating this crime. Here's A, here's B. It's all process, but it's not good process, not interesting process. And there's no real high stakes for our main characters. Yes. This, when, the, when ever is John Travolta Gandolfini in danger in this movie? Never. Never. Not a single moment. Nope. James Gandolfini's biggest danger in this movie is that he never gets to finish his like pastrami sandwich or whatever he's eating. <laughs> that, that's his, that is the great threat he faces. But but the movie does establish them as the main characters. Yes. Now, if you change the opening scene or opening scenes mm-hmm. and make it so our, the audience's POV is going to be Jared Leto and Selma Hayek, who yeah. play the Lonely Hearts Killers, and make them the anti-hero protagonist, yeah. then maybe you got a movie here. Yeah, this, this movie is straddling an uncomfortable middle ground yes because it's not um a film what's it, bonnie and clyde which right. is the great following the criminals movie exactly nor is it a heat which is the great detective, detective fo- with personal issues right getting in the way of his crime and it's not public enemies which is after this movie yes. public enemies came out in 2007 i think mm. but it's not public enemies where it creates a sympathetic antagonist yes with a unsympathetic protagonist, yeah. uh, Christian Bale and Johnny Depp mm-hmm. as John Dillinger. Yeah. Um, it doesn't do either of that, any of those things either. And I think Public Enemies is, is a great contrast to this movie. Because I think one of the things Public Enemies does is that that's a movie that's... I like Public Enemies. I, I think in part it is saved by its performances. Because Michael Mann's an incredible director. I will not yeah. dispute that. But Christian Bale's character feels very underwritten in the movie. Mm. And he, Christian Bale underplays him a lot. And the first time I watch, I'm like, what is going on with Christian Bale in this movie? Like, he, he's just not acting. And then I rewatch the movie, and I'm like, no, Christian Bale's giving an amazing performance in this movie. Really? Yes. I haven't seen it recently. I really want to, though. The Like, the first time I watched Public Enemies, Christian Bale is so underplaying his character yeah. that it's not that, like, you're like, it doesn't even feel like it's a performance. It feels like Christian Bale walks in a scene and goes, yeah, we're going to invest down Jill and he said, we're going to do it. And then you watch it again, and you're like, Christian Bale's playing this very emotionally <laughs> repressed man. And every one of those choices that feels like it's not a choice is a deliberate choice. If that mm. makes sense as a sentence. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. But basically my point is, Public Enemies is a movie where a character who feels underwritten is saved by this character imbuing so much humanity yeah. into them. Yeah. Whereas in this movie, none of the characters are, feel written fully. And, and the performances don't save them and even if they're good i i was you know one of the comparisons i was making earlier when talking about public enemies because you talked about like it's not the bonnie and clyde thing where we have the sympathetic villains that we are following but it's also not the heat thing where we have the unsympathetic detectives with their yeah. issues public enemies is something different in between but in a good way where it's it takes a duality of two yeah. different it's a cat and mouse uh chase yeah. movie where you have Christian Bale and Johnny Depp fully like it's it's a back and forth movie. If it's not a Johnny Depp scene, it's a Christian Bale scene, and we're seeing these comparisons between these mm-hmm. two vastly different lifestyles and cultures and where these guys are coming from. Yeah. And I think it does a great job of straddling that line. Granted, yes, you have Johnny Depp and you have Christian Bale yeah. fulfilling those. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I mean, Johnny Depp, say what you will, but I mean, born to play John Dillinger. Yes. Better than his Captain Jack Sparrow performance. Fight me. Ooh, fight me. That's a spicy. That's a spicy take. Fight me. I'm not gonna fight you. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's not, that's Jeff, not... Jeff. Fight me. <laughs> I'm not gonna fight you. That's a good take. I appreciate you throwing it out. Jeff, I want you to throw a punch at me and fight me right now. <laughs> All right, guys, we're gonna pause the episode so Toss and I can get into a fight. Jeff, what are you doing? Jeff, stop! Stop! Ow! <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was fun. That was great. 
That was real. That was that was a plus humor for the audience at home. Jeff's making me feel a, a bit lonely here <laughs> in this a, bit. A lonely heart. <laughs> Get it? You're breaking my heart because I feel lonely. But yeah, I feel like in that conversation we basically talked about all the context we need for this movie. You no, know, it's Todd Robinson making a movie about his grandfather and his father. Yeah. And it's a period gangster film. So I feel like we can probably just dry, dive right into it. Yeah, I agree. Mm-hmm. So uh, we get started. Uh, first things first is period piece music. Yes. Photo- Grandpa- photography Grandpa- montage. Grandpa- we got some dodgy composite work in this in these photographs, though, let me tell you. We're, we're, we're recording two episodes this weekend with very dodgy compositing opening <laughs> credits montages. I wasn't going to say that, but yes, <laughs> that is very true. Because And I don't know how these movies have the most incredible visual effects sometimes, but they can't seemingly find a good, a good Photoshop artist to make these old photographs. Because it'll be like an actual period photo of a bunch of cops standing in a row, and then there's like crystal clean looking John Travolta on the side. Yeah, I mean, we'll talk about the other movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this one, I, I really, from the moment this movie started, I almost started falling asleep. Yeah, this is a very boring movie. This is a very boring movie. It doesn't get interesting until, I was texting you, Jeff, during this, because uh, like we said, we're this is the first recording that takes place after New Year's, yeah. and I watched this movie yesterday. Yes. I was very hungover from New Year's Eve. Um, I had probably gotten like four hours of sleep and I'm sitting here and I'm like trying to keep my eyes open. And so I text Jeff and I'm like, am I just really hung over and tired or is this movie boring? And then Jeff, you know, gave me hope and said, no, this movie really <laughs> this is, is very boring. Just very boring. So I'm like, okay, good. I'm not, I'm not just like brick, you know, tied to, to my, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, we start and, uh, we see a cake. Yes. That says three year anniversary Mm -hmm. or no, just anniversary something. And then at the end of this montage, we see the woman with the cake and she walks into a bathroom and shoots herself. Yes. And uh, kills herself. Uh, Gunshot to the head. Then three years later. Yes. We cut three years later with no context as to what just happened. Yeah. Uh, And James Gandolfini starts monologuing, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is where he just starts going like, I was a cop. During the time of the lonely 19, 1948, I was a cop in New York City. Is it really 1948? This movie is set in 1948 by the end. God damn, you <laughs> memorized that. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, Game of does the, we, I was a detective during the lonely hearts killings. I was a detective during the lonely hearts killings. And uh, it, it was a day of the execution. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, we're, but, at the, we're at the execution. We're at the execution. The... So we're told that, that they, they get caught. We're told that they get caught, and we're told that all the main characters make it out okay. Because <laughs> they're all at this execution. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> what, what, what is this movie already doing? <laughs> you know, like, the real, like, this is not a bad way to start a movie, but because it is history, so everyone knows that they got executed. Presumably. Right. Yeah. I feel like the better version of this end, this opening is we still start with Gandolfini at the execution and he's modeling be like, yeah, we caught him. And he starts talking about Robinson, but we don't see Robinson at the execution. Right. And then that leads to like the drama of, was he not there because he died died or why is he not? And at the end you can just be like, no, he was just off camera. Yeah. But that's, that would have been an interesting hook for the opening. But it doesn't do Instead that. Instead, it's just like, yeah, these guys made it out. Both, <laughs> and bo- both and guys uh, appear on screen. Yeah, they win at the end. So it's at the execution. Gandalf did voiceovers. Yeah. They have is some this... exposition on the killers. So this, I do want to point, this is the fourth James Gandolfini movie we've covered. Yeah, he does a lot of... Uh, this is his fourth collaboration with John Travolta. Fourth collaboration with John Travolta. They did um, Get Shorty. Get She's Shorty. so lovely. A civil action in this. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah. I don't know mm. what the... I mean, he he has four collaborations with James Gandolfini, yet one collaboration with Nicolas Cage. Criminal. What are you doing, Hollywood? <laughs> what are you doing? I, I mean, his collaborations with James Gandolfini tend to be pretty good. Yes. Some of I his mean, the other three that we just named are good pretty movies. good movies. Get Shorty is the best Gandolfini performance, though, of the four we've covered. Um, Where he's playing the stump man who's incapable of being an actual bodyguard. <laughs> Yeah. 
I mean, he's done better performances in the other movies, but in terms of how much I enjoy his performance, that is my favorite. He was very scumbaggy, and she's so lovely. Yeah. He did that very well. And he was just the everyman in a civil action. He was, yeah, yeah, the sympathetic yeah, father. I'm, I'm working here. <laughs> um, James Gandolfini is literally just like Detective yeah. Stromboli. Yeah, he's, he's literally <laughs> <this> de- de- <laughs> de- de- Detective. <laughs> I was going to say the same thing. I know. I know you were. Det- took, took it out from under you. Detective Stromboli. <laughs> <laughs> he's literally, every scene he walks in, he's like holding like, a salami sandwich. <laughs> like, I think I was expecting it to just keep escalating by the end. Of the he walks in with a whole like brick of salami, <laughs> and he's just eating it raw from the tube on the very end. Chasing, yeah. <laughs> he's just like, I gotta take a bite. <laughs> he discovers the body. He walks out so sad, takes a bite. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, <laughs> at the execution scene, yeah. it's a ginormous explosion. <laughs> and he's like, just like anyone else. Will... You know, they're putting him in the chair, and he's like. <laughs> <laughs> Like a corn cop. <laughs> you seen like a corn cop just. <laughs> it fits the entire row of guys at yeah. the. Ex- he's like, hey. he's like, hey, you know, I brought some to share. I brought some own. to share. I take a bake up for you. Oh, own, mama mia. I'm not gonna cook it like this guy, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> At least you're having a good time talking yeah. about this movie. Yeah. <laughs> James Gandolfini was a gifted actor, but he's like, <laughs> and he's very good in this movie. But he is playing like Detective, <laughs> detective Mastromboli. <laughs> he really is. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he, he gives some exposition on the killers. They're walking so, into yeah, an electric, know, electric. They're electric, going into an electric chair room. <laughs> yeah, so that they're going into an electric chair room, and then we get a flashback, another flashback. Yeah, but this is a flashback. The other thing is, there's no POV in this movie. Yes. Like, it makes you want to think that John Travolta is the main character, but it's not a strong... Yeah, but then John Travolta disappears for like a 30 minute segment. Yeah, this movie. It, fuck exactly. So, so then we have again another flashback, but it's Jared Leto's flashback. Yes. Jared Leto, who plays Ray Fernandez. Ray, Ma- Raymond Martinez Fernandez. Raymond Martinez Fernandez. Mm. I'll just call him Ray. Uh, he is a con artist. Uh, what he yes. does is he marries women for their money, then like leaves them yeah. and takes their money. Yes, he he uses lonely hearts like newspaper listings and whatnot, and magazines. You know, it's a weird like like they had Tinder back in the forties. Yeah, it, but it was like you you had to buy the magazine. <laughs> you had to buy the magazine. You had to go down to like, the grocery store and like buy the magazine without the cashier noticing the magazine. You and they were had buying. phones back then, but it was kind of like that was like switchboard phones, right? Where you had to call yeah. the operator and be like, "Operator," and they're like, yeah. "Uh, like, dial me into this uh, number, please." And they're yeah. like, "Okay." Hold on. And yeah. obviously, they're all listening to your conversations. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, hey, is this the Stella from the Lily Well, you Hearts? would mostly do it by letter, I believe, at the time. Oh, fuck. They still send letters. Yeah, because that's what he's oh, doing. Is he's, my God. Is he yeah. writes up a bunch of generic letters and sends them to like 10 women at a time. What a fucking player. That's yeah. like what I do on Tinder. I just swipe right 10 <laughs> times. Don't even look at the photos. I just do it. <laughs> See what I get back. <laughs> And then take their either. money and murder them. No, no! I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't do that. Yeah. Jared don't. Leto, um, who is so method, I can only presume he actually murdered people for this role. <laughs> okay, pause. You can't tell me that John Travolta got the script of this movie and thought, oh, so they want me to play Ray, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the womanizer, woman killer? Yeah. <laughs> like, no. Yeah. It's like, no, John, we don't want you to play no. that role. No, we want you to play Elmer C. Robinson, the sad detective. <laughs> the sad detective. Like, oh, you don't want me to play the attractive, skinny mm-hmm. fellow that... No, John. Attra- no. no. <laughs> that time has passed. That, that time, that was 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. You got to let that go. All right. So, so we meet Leto and he's pulling one of his schemes. Yeah. And it works. Yeah. Um, And then he next meets... Like, it pretty much is he just, it works. There's not really... It's just an exposition scene to show what he does yeah. and how he uh, does all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get another Travolta uh, Robinson scene where the, the precinct. So that yeah. flashback continues on. Yeah. So he flashback three years, and then we just kind of continue from that point. Well, we started with the, with the suicide. Yeah. Then we flash forward three years. And now we flash back like two years. Well, no, because it, it's before the suicide. Oh, yeah. So it's just a few. So like well, three was, and a half years. No, the suicide's already happened by this point. The suicide's already happened? Yeah, because we meet up with Travolta. I thought that was Jeanette with Ray and Martha, though. 
with the hammer. No. Does that so? Mean? Yeah. So we fucking hell. So we we flash back. Who died? Who in can, the opening? Yeah. That was uh, Travolta's wife. Stewart did not get this. This is not a failing on Stewart. This is a failing on the movie. Um, Do you blame me though? No. So in this scene that we were talking about, it's established that Travolta, after his wife committed suicide, for reasons unknown to us, um, he took a desk job, and Gandolfini's just like, yeah. So he, he's been doing the just job for like two years now. You know, whatever. And he's describing how he was the best cop, and now he just takes a desk job because he has no passion anymore. And all the cops are trying to set him up with Laura Dern, uh, who is in this movie for, like, one scene. Well, she's in multiple scenes, but it's like her character has no agency other yeah, than she has sleeping no with Elmer Robinson. Yes. Which disrespects Laura Dern. Yeah. You mean, talk, talk about uh, uh, Dr. Ellie Sattler. Ellie Sattler <laughs> in Jurassic Park. Uh, Disrespect to Amal and Holdo. Uh, uh, Thirteen years later, after yeah. Jurassic Park, gets a role of "I'm the lady that sleeps with the detective." Mm-hmm. Get the fuck out of here! Yeah, come on, don't disrespect Laura Dern like it's, that. It's very rude. But also, Laura Dern's agent manager should be fired. Mm-hmm. Come on. Well, this is probably like she could work for two days and make a few bucks. <sighs> yeah, probably. Probably right. So yeah, but uh, it's established like. He is sleeping with Laura Dern. Her name in this movie is... But that's his only... Uh, her name is Renee. Renee. But that's his only, quote-unquote, extracurricular activity. And all the other guys... He has a son, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't seem to know that. <laughs> but but Gandolfini and uh, all the other detectives are always trying to get him to go out to poker night with them. Yeah. But he says he uh, he's like, I'm not going anywhere, but I will take a ride with you to Gandolfini. We cut back to the Leto business. Where he meets Martha. Martha, Martha Beck. So uh, played by Salma, Salma Hayek. Hayek. Um, and she immediately figures him out and kind of joins up with his scheme. Yeah, so like he he starts her off as somebody who's going to be a potential victim for his scheme, yeah. but then, he sleeps with her, finds out she has an unemployment check. Yeah. So she's not loaded. So he's about to leave, but then she figures him figures out. him out. Says, "I know you scam women." Yeah, joins the plot. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna sidebar for a second here. Yeah, let's sidebar. Have you seen what uh, Ray Fernandez and Martha Beck actually look like? No. Okay. I'm gonna show you a picture of what they actually looked like, and then uh, you're gonna tell me how they they possibly got Jared Leto and Salma Hayek out of this. Oh God. All right. Uh, th- this is Jeff showing me on his laptop. I'm this is waiting. the actual photo of them. What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck? Come on. So, for the audience at home. I have a I have a, a thing I want to say about that. So, they were actually about the correct age for the movie. In spite of what that guy looked like, he is actually just 36. Uh, but, but for the audience, they are both, I would say, relatively healthy, health, like, above healthy weight. Yeah. Maybe they're little... they're normal looking people, but like Marth they're both uh like significantly more overweight than Selma. the actors playing and them. Jared Leto is like like the machinist Christian Bale yes. skin size. Like he is very skinny. And so Sama Hayek, like just average weight. And so it's it's very annoying. it's like the Hollywood thing where even though they're serial killers, they're the bad guys of this movie. They had to make them have sex appeal and kind of I don't want to say disrespect the real people because they were murderers, but well, it's I, a Hollywood. I, I, I kind of have a thought about that. So, because be- beauty standards back then were very different than what they yeah. are in 2006. In 1940s, like slightly larger women yeah. were actually somewhat seen as attractive mm-hmm. because in Met you were uh, living in a decently wealthy yeah. household. You could afford a lot of food. And you could afford a luxurious lifestyle. And also, in terms of just how men's brains were at that time, that we liked curves more that way. I mean, um, like Marilyn Monroe versus the models of today look drastically different. Yes. So I kind of feel like that this was a decision of, like, maybe 
historically speaking, they were thought of as a two like cute ish couple. Yeah. But if they showed that in today's standards that we would not in today's standards, mm. we would look at that and be like, they don't look that attractive. Yeah. So what do they do is they put Jared Leto and Selma Hayek in the role to sort of. Yeah, I would I would say it straight up comes down to the studio probably said we need sex appeal in this movie. And yeah. So you're casting Jared Leto and Salma Hayek. Yeah. That they don't look anywhere close yeah, so to them. Look absolutely nothing like the people. Yeah. So I would not have known that if you had not shown that to me. Yeah. But you know, that's... very different people. Yeah. So uh, yeah, they team up, and uh, Elmer and Charlie. This goes back and forth a lot. Yeah. But Elmer and Charlie. Travolta and Gandolfini. Gandolfini's real name is Detective Charlie, not Detective Stromboli. Uh, <laughs> Detective Charlie Stromboli. Detective Stra- De- Detective Charlie uh, Pepperoni Stromboli. <laughs> Take the pepperoni pizza. Uh, uh, Fettuccine Stromboli yeah. uh, investigates a suicide. This is where I thought the opening suicide scene was a little. Yeah, no, it's a different suicide. Yeah, that's why I got confused by that. As mm-hmm. I sort of put the two to two together. Uh, so it looks suspicious. Uh, Scott Kahn yes. plays a Detective Riley. Jeff, do you want to describe who Detective Riley is in this movie? So Detective Riley is like an asshole, and that is his character. He's yeah, a, that's it. He shows up. He's played by Scott Kahn, who is the son of James Kahn, uh, who will show up in every single scene, hands in his pockets, and just mosey up and be like, uh, reminds you of your dead wife, don't it? <laughs> and then slap his knee and walk off. I'm not going to search the basement. You kidding me? <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to do that. The, he's the most worthless character. I don't know why he's in this movie. <sighs> Historical, he, he, maybe. He's, he just, like, sticks with them <laughs> at all time. I, I don't know why he's there. But they, they investigate the suicide. Yeah. And the commissioner... And, and Riley are ready to just like write it off as like a suicide. She was sad. It's at this point I write down more police work. Dot dot dot. Yawn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it's like it, like police work should be exciting in a movie. It can Why, be. Like it can. It be. It really can be. Like when you're watching a great detective novel and you're put, watching them put it together, like that's exciting. Sidebar. Favorite scene in Public Enemies. The scene when John Dillinger walks into the police station. Oh, that's a good scene. It's the fucking best scene of the whole movie. Mm. And like, I know that's kind of not really a detectives working on the case yeah. thing, but that scene does share with you a lot of exposition on how far the detectives are in the yeah. case without just them talking about it. Yeah. Instead. I mean, I don't know if that actually happened historically speaking. I know. Public, I, be- I believe that that scene did not. I, Cause I know public enemies. They took a lot of, uh, they took a lot of uh, what's the term? Uh, liberties they took a, yes they took a lot of liberties with the story um and its historical um nature but but that that that's a very well accomplished scene and like how do we catch the audience up in terms of how much the detectives have accomplished at this point mm-hmm. uh i don't remember the police work scenes yeah I do, do you no i don't even remember what they accomplished they're all like the big get out of this scene is that Travolta thinks no, there's more to this than she just killed herself. Yeah, and uh, he's correct. Yeah, um, eventually, I read. Everyone's down, like, "Well, we'll just write this off as a suicide." And he's like, "No, we got to investigate this." Yeah, I and wrote then, this down as a then uh, Ray and Martha scene happens. Like it just kind of goes back yeah, and it just forth back a lot, and, forth. and they all kind of blend together. That I don't know what happens. Yeah. So like the next note I have is. Elmer decides to pay for her funeral. Yeah, he pays for the the dead woman's funeral. And it's something about, like, now it makes more sense in terms of why Gandolfini's sort of pressing on him of if he's too close to the case. Because they're probably thinking, oh, he's investigating this, and it looks like his wife's suicide, familiar-wise, so he might be too close to it. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, he pays for her funeral. Mm. Uh, Because the alternative is she was going to be sent to some uh, college, medical school. Yeah, and get cut up for you know, treat the scientist. We don't want to fucking do that. Yeah. God damn it. Let's bury her and take up the space. Mm-hmm. Jeff, what what are your plans for death? Uh, shot into the sun. Really? Yeah. I'm hoping it's affordable uh, in about 50 years. <laughs> you think I, you might be? No, I don't think. Well, I mean, 50 years, you never reusable rockets and shit. Yeah. You know, it could be, could be. Um, have you seen uh, the Jeff Bridges sleeping tapes? 
heard heard the Jeff Bridges sleeping tapes? No. There's one tape where he it's all it's an ASMR eight track album. Okay. The entire it's an eight track album. Is it all by dedicated. Jeff Bridges? Yeah. Jeff Bridges does the voice. <laughs> He's like, I'm gonna tell you how to go to sleep, and uh, it's literally all an ASMR thing. Are you looking it up right now? I am. It's at, you listen to it on YouTube tonight. You're welcome. But there's one thing where he talks about how when he wants to die, he wants his ashes to be put into a satellite that's going to have an orbit where every year it's going to la- line up right to the place of his birth at on the day of his on his birthday. And so you if you ever want to go visit like the burial site or whichever it is, you can look up in the satellite. There's a light on the satellite. It's going to blink mm-hmm. when it goes. Over. So it's like you go to like his memorial or whatever on his birthday and at the cer- exact time he was born you look up and you'll see a blinking light and that's a satellite with his ashes mm. in it i'm like fucking hey jeff Bridges. <laughs> okay fucking jeff a. um that was not important at all to the conversation yeah but it, w- it was a nice sentiment okay so uh, to, I love the next thing i got was ray and martha are in the car and martha is giving ray a blowjob yes um while they're driving and he's kind of like sway, swinging back and forth yeah because like, oh god and they get pulled this over by like, a this is, hey this is real carry vibes right <laughs> yeah <laughs> Had to bring and it back. uh they get pulled over by a yeah cop. and they're driving a stolen car by the way and so salma hayek martha goes and gives the cop a blowjob yeah because like jared leto ray is like very like upset he's like what we're getting, getting pulled over like this is a stolen car he's gonna check the plates like let me handle it then she gets out of the car he sees all this happen on the rear view She gets into the passenger seat, which, like, I love that, like, back in, like, the 40s, any cops weren't at all concerned about people getting out of their cars yeah. during traffic stops. Because <laughs> that happens, like, three times in this yes, movie. <laughs> where they <laughs> just get out. They just get out, walk towards the car, and the cops are like, oh, what you doing? Let's <laughs> give me a baseball card. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, she gets in the passenger seat and then gives him a blowjob. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jared Leto is like, oh my god, why is she fucking doing that? <laughs> That's how he reacts. Yeah. Uh, then she gets out. Jared Leto's a bit overplaying in this movie. <laughs> yes, he is, and, and I will talk about that in a second. Um, so I wrote down. Then they get off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, she gets back in his car. Um, she's reapplying her lipstick. Cop comes back up to Jared uh, Leto's window and be like, "All right, you're free to go. Just slow down." Mm-hmm. And then he leaves. And that's that. And that's that. <laughs> that's the scene. Yeah. What What did that scene tell you about the characters, Jeff? Nothing, but it does uh, play in later. Yes, it does, but uh, but not particularly exciting. Later. Yep. Uh, so Elmer and Charlie talk to the girls, landlord or something. Fam- I wrote down family friend. Like, yeah, they talk to someone who knew the girl. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, she was seeing this guy Ray Martin. Yeah. And uh, that puts them on trying to hunt down Ray Martin. More police work. I wrote down yawn. Yes. <laughs> okay. To, to, to the listener at home, we're not like we're skipping over large sections of the movie, not just because nothing happens. Yeah. It's always just like Travolta sitting there and, and like silently staring at a piece of paper, and he's like, "We gotta catch these guys." And then that's the scene, and then we cut to Salma Hayek and Jared Leto walking around, and be like, "We gotta kill these people," and then it just keeps doing that. That's the movie. For an hour and... 20 minutes before like the actual plot kicks in. Because it's an hour and 40 minute movie, yes. right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then uh, that's when I wrote down the director as the grandson of, yeah. of John Travolta's character. That's when I looked it up. I'll, uh, I'll skip to the next big part, um, unless you have something to say. What's the next big part? Ray and Martha uh, pick their next target. Jeanette? Jeanette. Yeah. Uh, sure. Who says... Uh, yeah. Who's dancing with Leto in a club and says she, he makes her feel positively adolescent. <laughs> Great. I wrote down that. Uh, very. I wrote down that because I thought that was a good phrasing. Love it. Uh, and Salma Hayek's getting a little jealous of her because she's like, you're getting too, you're my guy and you're getting a little too close to your marks. And he's like, I can't make the money if we don't do this. She's like, I don't care about the money. I care about having you for my own. Yeah. Uh, this is going to get him to some problems later. Yes. <laughs> uh, but they continue with the Jeanette thing. Yeah. Uh, then they uh, they get to a house. Yes. They get to her house. It, well, one of Ray's. Oh, yeah, one of Ray's houses. One of Ray's houses. 
it's just his house. But he says, oh, I have... Because it's he, one of my rental properties. He's pretending to be richer than he is. Yeah. He's like, we're just here for a business deal, and then we're out of here. And then we're going to Florida. Mm-hmm. So, um, are we just going to go to the big scene? Yeah, we'll go to the Okay. Place. So, at the same time, Travolta figures and Gandolfini figure out... That it's the real Ray. The, who the they, real they Ray. They figure out the, who the real Ray is, and they figure yeah. out he has a property in Florida, mm-hmm. and that he has a P.O. box in Florida. And they check the P.O. box, and there's nothing in it. But they find out how he has an address somewhere. Yeah. And they find oh they find yeah. the address from the P.O. box. Yeah. That's it. So okay, the big scene. Uh so Jeanette and Ray are having sex. Yes. And, and Martha's getting pissed because she's jealous. She's right and she's in the next room and she can hear it all happening. Yeah. And Jeanette is like, Tell me you love me. Tell me you love me. And he's like, uh and uh. Jared Leto is like playing this very like He's playing it so strange. He is playing it very strange. He's sitting there like, ah. Ah. (laughs) (laughs) Like, like instead of just not saying anything or faking, being uh, like, or just kind of being like, I love you or something like that. Right, yeah. He's like, ah. (laughs) Why? I don't know. I don't know either. (laughs) So then he's like, "I, I love you, kitty cat. Yes. And then she's like, oh, yeah. And then, uh, and then, you just see blood fly everywhere, and she's like, oh, and she falls over, and you see Martha stand there with a the hammer. Yeah. Uh, it's a huge, like, blast of blood. Yeah. It is rather sizable. It goes right on Leto, and he's like, ah! Yeah. This is a very, sh- like, sh- shocking scene. It's yeah. like, oh, wow, <laughs> and I'm awake now. <laughs> it comes out of nowhere. I wrote that murder is wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because then she gets into bed with him. Yeah. And then she starts kissing him, and it's yeah. like, oh. And then like, they hear a noise, and they're like, oh, she's still alive. Well, and then she says, like, oh, I want you to finish yourself off. Yeah. And so he starts masturbating, and he's, like, telling her, it's like, I love you, I love you. And then the cam- then it cuts to this overhead boom shot Yeah. looking down at the bed, and then it dollies to the left, and you can see lying down next to the bled is Jeanette just wriggling, yeah. wriggling in her own blood. And death. And it was really fucked up. Yeah. Kind of liked it. Uh, so the next... <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's kind of... It's like a scene with some life to it, even though it is a death scene. It, it's something. The, the next bit is like... This movie could have been a dark comedy if they wanted it to be. They didn't. It could have. Because like the next scene is Jared Leto trying to shove her in a box, <laughs> but she doesn't fit. <laughs> But she doesn't fit, and he's like, just slamming the lead down. And Martha's like, you got to push harder. And I'm like, this is a very strange tone scene. But then she says, like, oh, she won't fit. It's like, we can make her fit. And then she, she pulls has a buzz saw. She pulls out a saw. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they end up using the saw. Yeah. They just kind of talk about that they're going to use yeah. the saw. No, I think they use the saw. Well, they bury her in asphalt. Yeah, I didn't know if they used a yeah. saw for that. But. I think they put her in the box so they could bury yeah. her. So they leave, and they take the money, and yeah. they're in a car, and Martha tells Ray she wants a baby. Yes. And Ray's like, oh, okay, we'll figure that out. My favorite part about that is she's like, uh, we don't want them to live in the city because there's too many creeps in the city. Yeah. Meanwhile, they just murdered somebody. Yes. That's, I thought that was a good bit. And so the next bit is uh, Travolta and Gandolfini show up at the house. Yes. And they miss them by like five minutes. Or as Gandolfini says, missed them by five miles. Then the case went cold. Yeah. Uh, so they, they investigate the house and they can't find anything. They do go to the basement. And, and they see blood dripping from the ceiling. Yeah. So they know like there's Some, a lot of blood there. Yeah. And so they rip up the floorboards and they find a lot of blood. And someone was killed there. But they don't have a body and they don't have the killers. Right. Uh, and so they're kind of a dick to the landlord in this moment. Yeah, so, they are. So, <laughs> I wrote down, they destroy so, this guy's property. Yeah, so they're outside the house and Travolta kicks the door in. Yeah. They do a quote unquote no knock warrant because they knock once and then immediately kick the door in. Uh, <laughs> well, because that was a whole bit, right? Where they're like showing up at the door. It's like, all right, so we're going to knock first, right? It's yeah. like, right. And then they knock and then bam, yeah. just smash so, the door in. And so... They're there, and the landlord shows up in the aftermath and is like, who's going to pay for fix my door? And they're like, you are. You are harboring cr- killers. And it's like, no more, how's the guy supposed to know? Um, and then Scott and then, Kahn and kicks another door in and says, pay for that one too, and then walks off. 
I don't even know what's what's, what's, and the landlord's like, I'm a guy trying to make money. What what is it? It's like I'm trying to just think of like the logic here. If yeah. like if you're the director, it's like, is this a scene to try to make our characters look cool? Yeah. Or like I have look no idea. buff or bit like I don't understand. I think the the, int- the idea is supposed to show that the landlord like is more concerned about himself than that someone was killed in his property, but like who cares? Yeah, it very much just comes off as these guys want to be dicks to this yeah. landlord. That's how I kind of got it. And so they, Gandalf says the case went cold for a while. And so we're back with Travolta, and he's at home, and he's with Laura Dern. Is this when Eddie discovers the affair? Yes, because they're talking about Eddie, who is Travolta's son. Notice we haven't really talked about Travolta much in this movie because he's not even playing a character. Oh, my God, you're right. He's playing an archetype. Um <sighs> And Charles is not bad in this movie, but this is the exact. He's not doing anything. This is the exact performance he gets into a lot in the next few years, He's where not... it's a lot of like the doing the the scowl and looking off into the horizon performances, which is like Travolta's great skills as an actor are being charming and being funny. Yeah, and those are all of his best performances. Even Blowout, like. Is as a serious mo- it is, there are yeah. some really and he's very charming in it, yeah. and it works because Brian De Palma is a great director. Uh, unlike Todd Robinson. Sorry. Um, Todd Rob. <laughs> no offense, Todd. What was that? Oh, was that Todd? <laughs> He's coming. Oh, my God. Who is that? <laughs> ah, Todd, no. <laughs> um, All right. But, so uh, yeah, uh, John- Jeff just got shot. Um, <laughs> by Todd Robinson. By Todd Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, and Laura Dern and him are talking. And she's like, you know, you're too emotionally uh, uh, held back, or what would you call it? Like, stuck inside your... Emotion. He's not displaying his emotions. Yeah. Well, she's like, why are you leaving for? It's like, nothing. It's fine. It's like, uh, I'm not your wife, so don't treat me like one. Yeah. And he's like, emotionally repressed. That's the word I'm looking for. He's too emotionally repressed, and she's like, your son hasn't cried about your wife's death yet because you haven't, and he's looking to you for like guidance in dealing with his grief. Cause this movie is trying to be about, Hey Jeff. Yeah. I don't care. It's trying to be about this family reconciling. I don't using, care. Using him catching these criminals as like a catharsis. Uh, I don't care. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> succeed at any of it. I don't care about it. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> this is where I stopped taking notes. Uh, I wrote like yeah. three more notes after this, just like of, Random things. Can we just get to the big heavy hitter points and wrap this up? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, that's... that's... Okay, well, Eddie discovers the affair and he's mad at Travolta. He's mad Um, at it, And it's established that the reason she might have killed herself is because she found out he was having an affair prior to... While they were still married. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, It's it's really thrown off. His character just says that. I I, I don't remember that part, but okay. So, Uh, Leto, the... The Lonely they Hearts show Killers. Up at another house. They show up at another house with a French woman named Delphine. Who is another one of Ray's yeah. scam women. And she has a daughter named... Who's not his daughter. Yes. Right? I, uh, is his daughter? No, it's not his daughter. It's not his daughter. Um, Pretty much everyone he's like hooking up with has a husband who died in the war. Because yeah. shortly after World War II. Yes. And right. so they're collecting remember that. benefits from the government. I do remember so they're, that. So yeah. they're moderately... Yeah. So... Uh, she shows up, or he, Ray and Martha show up to this house where Delphine is with her, like, eight-year-old daughter, I might mm. say. Maybe five, or, uh, six or seven, maybe. Uh, little girl. And, um, yeah, they move in for a while. Uh, the next thing I remember, Jeff, is Martha and Delphine... Yeah. Are together and Delphine tells her she's pregnant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like she's like, how yes, many nights? So good at we are pregnant. <laughs> oh. Well, you forgot. It's like, <laughs> yeah. she's vomiting and and Martha's like, my, why are you vomiting? It's and like, she's like, my bo- I always vomit before I am pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> and then she pulls out a baguette and starts eating it and walks off screen. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the audience, what the audience doesn't realize is this movie makes quite a turn near the end. Uh, so the, the climax of this movie is actually... See, you think it's going to be the Catch the Lonely Hearts Killers? The climax of this movie is actually a sword fight. No. Where uh, she's wait- wielding a baguette and Gilfini comes in with a stick of salami. And they engage in a sword fight. 
<laughs> oh god, it's evil weed. She, it's she, like, oh, we got an extra bowl. She's like, oh god, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, oh and, god. And he's like, mamma mia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. then as they fight, the Stromboli and the Baguette yeah. make a sandwich, yeah. and they realize that their differences don't matter in the yeah. grand scheme of the universe, so the, and they the, make love on the floorboards. Yeah, Delphine and uh, Detective Stromboli actually ride off into the sun. <laughs> <at the end. laughs> no, that's not actually what happens. But. Guys, I really wish this is how the movie went. <laughs> <laughs> that would, that I, would be the superior I film. I really wish this is how this movie ended, but unfortunately... I'm going to have to go yep. down the dark path of how this movie really went, which was mm. Delphine is throwing up at the bathroom. Martha's in that room. Yes. And when Delphine walks out, she's like, are you okay? And she says, well, my body punishes me right as I get pregnant. Yeah. So I always know when um, I get pregnant. Yeah. I do want to quickly say the actress playing Delphine uh, is Dagmara Dominicic. Um, mm. uh, she is one of the elite characters in Succession, if oh. you've watched the show. Cool. Um, so she did go on to, to I don't want to say better things or great things, but she did move on to, you know, success later in her career, which is great. Good she's, for her. she's rather good in this movie. And the three scenes she's in. Yes. <laughs> three scenes. Uh, um, so she's done dirty in this movie, but <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, she knows that she's pregnant. Yes. And it's with, uh, Ray's child. Yes. They, they spent one fucking night. Yeah, this place. You mean Ray can't keep it in his fucking pants yeah. <laughs> one night when he's got Martha? <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? And so she's pissed. Because Selma Hayek, I'm just going to say, folks, like, again, with the Hollywood standard in the fray of being a sexualizing trope, Selma Hayek is very attractive in this movie. Yes. And I'm just like, what the fuck, dude? Come yeah, and he's just like, ah! <laughs> and so- <laughs> yeah, that's Ray. Yeah. Just sh- waving his dick anywhere he can. So then Martha says, well, let me go get you some milk to help you feel better. Then Ray comes home mm-hmm. and he walks into the house and a little girl's crying. Yes. This little girl is played by a familiar child actress. She's played by Bailey Madison. Who's been in other stuff. Uh, she is in Bridge to Terabithia. Yeah. She's a little sister. Yeah, she's a little sister in Bridge to Terabithia. Um, she went on to actually be a um, fairly accomplished television actress. Uh, she was in Once Upon a Time, Wizards of Waverly Place. Uh, she was the lead in the show The Good Witch, which I have not seen. I assume it's a spinoff to The Good Doctor. In the uh, early 2000s, she was like the... That was a good joke, and I got no appreciation for it. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> she was like kind of on par with Haley Joel Osment, I would say. Well, she she wasn't in that much. Well, this was her first film. Really? Yeah, so it's this, Bridge to Terabithia, and that's the last thing I see in regards to her movies around that age that you would recognize. I must just really have loved her performance at Bridget Terabithia. Cause I she, feel like she, I mean, she did the, the usual television runs of like being in CSI as a kid, law and order SVU. She's in Merry Christmas, Drake and Josh. What is it with and child actors that well, like, get their first roles? And then next thing you know, their parents put them on like violent crime shows. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Every, every child actress winds up in a cop show at some point. We, we know one. We do. Yeah. Um, and she's an avid listener to the podcast. No, I'm sure she is. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, she was also in two episodes of Corey in the House. Uh, pay respects. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, do you see Corey is actually going to the big house? <laughs> no. <laughs> what? <laughs> the actor who played, uh, who played Corey in Corey in the House, Kyle Massey, uh, he was assaulted, on, he was arrested, uh, and is in prison right now for immoral communication with a minor. Oh, uh, dude. Corey, uh, Corey in the big house. Going to the big house. Corey's going to the big house. Oh, my God. So Ray comes home, and the little girl's crying. Yeah, she's locked in a room. And he walks in and sees Delphine. Like, panting on a couch. Yeah. like. And Martha's just standing there. Yeah. And I'm just going to fast forward through this scene, because essentially it's the same thing that's happening. Like, yeah. but. Uh, Basically, so Selma Hayek gives him a... He pulls out a gun on, on Martha. And he's like, what did you do to her? And he's like... Because he was kind of getting to love Delphine. Yeah. So then she's she basically says, if you love if you don't love me and if you love her, you should shoot me. Yeah. But if you love me, then you should shoot her. Yeah. And makes him choose. And then... Would, and you, then like Jared to, goes, would you like to describe for the audience how Jared Leto plays this scene? So Jared Leto is standing there and he's holding this gun back and forth, waving between them. And he's like... Ah! 
and then he shoots Delphi. And that's that's pretty much the same. In the head. In the set. Who's and panting. She, and she dies. And pregnant. Yes. Gro- <laughs> grotesque. I However, just, I, I just, will say, I, I, this is logically <laughs> should be the end of the first act of your movie, right? Yeah, because like this, this, is where, this, this is the turning point of Ray. Yes. Because at, prior to this, Ray's just a con guy. Yes. It's Martha who's the fucking psychopath. Like, this is logically where you're like, end of your first act or your midpoint should be. It like turns them into real criminals. And so this is the end of the movie. <laughs> so they, they kill her and then decide they will raise her daughter as their own, even though she's like eight already and very clearly aware of what's going on. Yeah. So they kidnap the girl. They're on the road. They get pulled over. And the cops walk in towards their car. Ray walks out, pulls out his gun, and shoots the cop. Yes. So they're on like a spree right yeah. now. But they stay at the same house. Because they, they, they do go, stay at the Because they buy her a bicycle or a tricycle and then go back to the house. And then, yeah. and Well, they don't just buy a tricycle. They pull up to like a farmer's market stand oh, yeah, on the, the side of the road. It says, how much for that uh, dog? Dog. He's like, oh, dog's not, not for, for sale. sale. I'll take it. Bam! And <laughs> no. shoots the guy. No, Jared Lewis says, everything's for sale. And the guy says, $1,000. And Jared Lewis, ah, and then he shoots the guy in the head and steals his dog. Yeah. So they're just on like a killing spree yes. at this point. At this point, he doesn't care. He's just killing people. Yeah. And so... What's Elmer and Charlie doing right now? Uh, probably eating some pastrami or something. I don't know. <laughs> All right. But no, we, um, we do cut back with them. And uh, they're getting closer to Ray. Well, because now they have like a dead cop, they yeah. have a dead like farmer, like, and they they figure out they're in Michigan. They figure out the house. Yeah. Well, there's one point where like they're talking to a local police department. Yeah. And they're showing them pictures, and there's one cop who doesn't look at the picture; he looks away. And Charles is like, "What's the deal with you?" And the guy's acting very sus. He's just like, "I don't know what you're talking about." Oh, right. Then this they is the guy that got the blowjob yeah, It's the weirdest Martha. scene. This is the same cop who got the blowjob. Yeah. And he's, like, acting like he doesn't know what's going on. Well, he he's, probably doesn't want to be complicit in, like, no, the whole thing. here's the thing. They're at the airport next, and the cop shows up and is like, I want to talk with you, Elmer Robinson. And he just tells Travolta everything in the car. Yeah. Like, Why didn't you just tell him earlier? <laughs> Why is this so secretive? He probably didn't want to tell him in front of the other. He could have grabbed him and been like, hey, can we go to this locked room over here? Instead of coming up to him in an abandoned car at the airport. Yeah. He basically just tells Travolta, though, it's like, they're all really crazy, but it's yeah. Martha, the one that you really got to look yeah. out for. And so, that, that's all. That's the vital that's context it. he gives them. So they go to the house. Yes. Ray and Martha are there. Yes. Um, the cops all show up. They arrest them both. There's yeah. not really much of a... There's not a shootout. Ray runs. Ray runs, but they catch well, him. Well, first, we want to acknowledge right before this scene, there's a section where uh, the daughter, um, Ray, Raynell, uh doesn't want to play along right yeah because oh yeah it's with martha and the daughter yeah, and she's martha's like, like gonna we gotta do you. something with this daughter right with yeah this girl so then the cops show up yes we don't see what they do with the little girl yeah but um, the cops show up uh, i just wrote down they get arrested because like there isn't like a yeah. shootout or well, a big chase what happens is they, gra- they immediately get martha there's no excitement they just capture her and then ray runs and travolta just tackles him yeah and that's it and they're like, where are the bodies? Where is anyone? Well, they, they know there's a little girl. Yeah. And they're like, where's the girl? Where's yeah. the girl? Where's the girl, Lebowski? <laughs> where's the money, Lebowski? <laughs> um, and so Gandolfini walks into the, uh, the the barn. And at the same time, Travolta, Travolta, he sees Leto's eyes darting to the tricycle box. Yes. And so we get this intercut of Gandolfini walking in the, gr- in the garage and seeing fresh asphalt on the ground. Yeah. Over like a, a body-sized hole. Yeah. And Travolta cracking open this tricycle box. He's like, oh, God. Oh, oh, oh God. Oh, oh, oh. It's the first time Travolta's, like, acted in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Yes, it really is, though. He's it- just like, oh, God. And it's a good performance. I wish he had been acting the rest of the movie. Um, he's like, oh, God. Oh, God. I, I, I don't and even he know looks up. Can- and he looks up and Gandolfini, like, strolls out of the, um, the, uh, the garage and looks up at him. And then Gandalfine dramatically opens a pack of cigarettes <laughs> oh, and pulls a cigarette-sized pastrami <laughs> out of it and puts it in his mouth. Uh, <laughs> there, real, it is, no. there it is. Um, so they killed the little girl, yeah. butchered her up, and you know, they, and they buried the body, yeah. the other body in there. So then, then they interrogate them. Yes, we don't see Ray until the execution scene because they only no, we do we do see Martha. Ray very briefly. Do they? Because he confesses pretty quick. I guess, yeah. Mostly in the interrogation scenes focus yeah. on uh, Elmer and Martha. Though. Yes. And then 
Elmer and Martha have a whole scene where he's like, why'd you do it? And she's like, you really want it to be that simple, don't you? Yes. And that's when she does the um, the Eddie Brock Spider-Man 3 line. It's like, I like being bad. Yeah. <laughs> it makes, it me, makes me happy. Makes me happy. <laughs> um, and then she's basically just like, I like denying you easy answers. It makes me feel good because you'll just be unhappy your whole life. Uh, and then she's like, I did it because I wanted Ray all for myself. Yeah. Uh, and then so Travolta, and then Travolta's like, no, I'm not going to think about you. You're just going to be a paperwork, a file I'm going to forget about. I don't care about you. And he kind of like, this is supposed to be the moment where he kind of works through his like, he files away his trauma. But Jeff, but Jeff, the movie doesn't put, I don't and, care. The movie puts I none of the like care. work. No, but the movie puts none of the legwork into doing this. Right, and therefore I don't care. Mm. Yeah, I just want to acknowledge what's trying to do because it yeah. s- fails it so terribly. Absolutely, I'm just here to say, like, for what they're I, trying to do, I don't care. Because like the good version of this movie, this is the big scene where like he manage he puts away his anger at her, while also putting away his grief at his wife. He's come to a place of understanding with everything. Yeah, and he files it all away. Um, and then the next scene is the execution. Let's talk about this. Yeah. Execution. So, so you've seen the Green Mile. Yes. I've seen the Green Mile. Yeah. Is that how electric chair executions normally go? Or the, is it how Lonely Hearts tells it? Uh, I would honestly guess the Lonely Hearts way. Really? You think it's long and drawn out? I mean, well, I can look up. I, I don't know if I want to look that up. <laughs> well, a little more. Because, like, here's the thing. I'm... Let, let me describe first for the audience what the Lonely Hearts execution chair scene is like. So, John, it, we cut back to where the movie sort of started up with, which is when Travolta and Gandolfini walk into the ex- electric chair room. Okay, it takes anywhere from two minutes to 15 minutes to die oh, in an electric chair. Fuck. <laughs> okay, then it's the Lonely Hearts version. Um, it's just interesting because the Green Mile makes it sound like it's instantly. Yeah. Like they pull the switch and you're like, Dang! and you're dead. Like mm-hmm. it's really quick. Not that way for the electric chair. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, they they walk in, they get uh Ray out, and he's like fighting the entire way, like he doesn't want to die. Yeah. They strap him in the chair, put the mask around him, and then and he's like, yeah. and then dies. And it's a very long, drawn out, brutal execution. That's mm-hmm. why I was thinking, like, are they over dramatizing this execution, yeah. or is that how normal? Because again, the Green Mile, like I thought. Green Mile executions were like really quick, but this one seemed like it was like really long. Because yeah. you know, in the Green Mile, they don't get the the sponge wet, and that's what causes what's the guy's name? Who like um, Michael? I know what's the actor's name? Who uh, who who doesn't get the sponge wet, and then he because of that he doesn't die right away with the electric chair. He gets mm-hmm. like toasted. Michael he Clark get, Duncan. No, because oh, no, it's that, not. It's, that's not him. It's the sec. It's there's three execution scenes in the Green Mile. It's the second one. Okay, yeah. Is it the Sam Rockwell one? No, Sam Rockwell doesn't get executed okay. in Green Mile. I'm, I haven't seen that movie in a long time. Yeah. Um, it's anyway. the guy with the mouse. The guy with the mouse. Yeah. Uh, whatever. Yeah, Ooh, whatever. Um, At any rate, uh, so and then they, uh, then after he's dead, they siphon him away. And then they get um, uh, Selma Hayek on the chair, and yeah. they don't really do the same thing they treat Ray with. Whereas Ray, they just like show you the electric chair death scene. Because yeah. once they flip the switch for her, uh, it all sound dies away, and it cuts to like the faces of the yeah. people watching, and they're kind of like, oh, yeah, God. like almost like what they've done is bad. Yeah, which like you know is the death penalty, which yeah. so you should feel bad. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, anyway. That's the that's my last note. Yeah, I before mean, before the hair ranking. Yeah, so the end. Oh, so the end of the movie is uh, they all go to some like Travolta leaves the force and moves to where Laura Dern is, who is in this movie as a reminder. <laughs> um, and he brings his son, and they cry together over his his wife's death, and they move on. Uh, and Gandalf finishes like he was the best cop I ever knew. Anyway, I'm heading down to the delicatessen on 27th and <laughs> 27th and Broadway. Gotta get myself some new st- stromboli. Oh, stromboli. I got a, I got a few sticks of pastrami on order. <laughs> it's like, oh god. Okay, uh, that's the movie. Yeah, that's the movie. Shall we go to the hair ranking? Yeah, let's do the hair ranking. All right, cue the music.
welcome to the hair ranking. Uh, so this is um, very floofy. Yes, it's definitely he's definitely at this point. Like I'm watching almost all these movies now, and from early 2000s, with the knowledge of they're probably extensions, mm -hmm. wigs, and all that stuff, because he's losing his hair pretty well from yeah. this point, right? So, but I thought it worked all right. I thought it was fine. Uh, so I already know where it's gonna go in the hair ranking. It's gonna go, uh, Jeff. If you have the the sheet pulled up, I can pull it up right now. I should have had this prepped. That's okay. That's all right. Uh, you know where it's gonna go, though. So I know you can it's just, you can I, just say it. It's gonna go below Mad City, above Chains of Gold. Below Mad City, above Chains of Gold. Yep. Which puts it at number seventeen. Yeah, it's decent. It's all right. It's not like, it, I would say it kind of falls in line with standard Travel to Hair, but with a little bit more fluff to it. Mm -hmm. Just ever so slightly. <laughs> Ever, ever so slightly. Have you seen Don't Look Up? Don't Look Up? Not yet. Oh, okay. Uh, Mark Rylance has a, a, like a role in it where he mm -hmm. plays like basically like a combination between like Elon Musk and Steve Jobs. Yeah. But he talks like this and he's like, everybody's fine. Everybody's so he's doing his Ready Player One performance. Yes, yes. That's exactly what he's doing. He's doing Ready Player One voice. Like, well, hello, everybody. It's, uh, oh, we're going yeah. to launch to the moon and... And we're gonna uh, siphon off the asteroid. And the he's minerals. so good in Ready Player One. Um, he's yeah, yeah, yeah. That was pretty the, good. The, he literally ties that movie together. The movie that could have been an absolute hellscape. And the book was really good. Yeah, I don't know. Really, I'm not big on the book. I like the wow. movie though. Really, because the book has like chapters where it's just like, here are the things that I watched from the '80s, and it's like three pages of like him listing TV shows and movies. I'm like, all right, all right. That kind of sounds pretty good. <laughs> like what you just described sounds like a book. But I like could get it's into. not it's not even him like, <laughs> like I could get into that. It's book. not even be like I like these things. It's literally just a page of like I watched Space Jam. I, I mean, watched X Men, the animated series. I'm like, okay, what's I kind of like that though. Yeah, I kind of like that shit. <laughs> hey, the, Jeff, the movie's yeah, pretty Jeff, good. You realize though. in the book, one of the missions. One of the missions to get the key oh, yes, is yes, him so. just walking through war games. Yes. <laughs> he just has to memorize the lines <laughs> of war games mm -hmm. of the Matthew Broderick character. Imagine if the movie had committed to the uh, the exact book, and that would be the least exciting <laughs> sequence of film of all time. <laughs> it would just be watching just... Ty Sheridan intercut into scenes out of war games for an hour and a half. Sounds fucking pretty yeah. awesome. Um, <laughs> anyway. Instead, they do the shining bit, which is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. Yeah, of course. So. I like that movie. It's, it's good. Um, Spielberg, King Don't Mess. Um, King Don't Mess. Uh, I'll say he does. Uh, West Side Story is great if you haven't seen it. I haven't seen it um, yet. Great movie. Okay. I think we talked about this. In, I can't remember. I can't remember. Anyway. Um, so that's Alone in the Hearts. You know what movie we haven't talked about yet that we've seen both seen recently? What? Oh, Spider-Man No Way Home. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to set a... <laughs> okay. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. What? Because the the audience, I'm sure, is desperate to hear our thoughts on... I did uh, the hair raking, by the way, so uh, I'm done with the movie. Yeah, well, we got... We do have to quickly wrap up the movie. Yeah. I'm going to set a 90-second timer. Okay. To the audience at home. First off, that's an hour and 30 minutes. Is that 90 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. This sure is longer than 90 seconds, and they're still talking right. about Spider-Man. <laughs> so I'm setting a 90-second timer. Okay. If the audience at home has not seen Spider-Man No Way Home yet, you can press that, that fast-forward button nine times if you have a 10-second timer. or Nine times. Or 15 seconds. Uh, if you have the 15 second timer, you can oh, press it six times. I can't remember. Is it the 15 second? Or if you have the 30 second timer, you can press it three times. Anyway, once this timer is up, we will be done talking about Spider-Man No Way Home. Uh, because the audience must hear our follow-up from the Punisher episode where we discuss the theme. 15 seconds. <laughs> the Sam Raimi five. theme music. Yeah. All right. Yes. All right. You ready? 90 seconds. Here we go. Okay. okay so, so they don't play the Sam Raimi theme music. <laughs> they <in> don't. <laughs> it's really weak, and it kind of bugged me. They play a little bit of it. But uh, Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are in this. Yes. But it's the most un, like, wow way possible. They, they just kind of walk through the thing. Yeah, they you, just kind of walk through the thing. I will tell you, I did see it again with my family. I have not seen it twice yet. It works a lot better on a rewatch. Um, Great. I'm about to rewatch this fucking movie. No, anyway, it, it does work a lot better on a rewatch. Yeah. 
Um, because you just kind of know what happens, so you're not there for the wow factor. You're just there to kind of try and enjoy the the film. Yeah. And No Way Home is kind of just it's everything I dislike of modern blockbusters. It's a it's a like high it's budget fa- fan film. Like it's fan service and all that. Yeah. It's very similar to The Rise of Skywalker, except it's better made than The Rise of Skywalker. Um, yeah, it's better than Rise of Skywalker. It's because it, it's it's fun. I had fun with it. Okay, but the crowning jewel of the movie. Willem Dafoe's yes, Green he's Goblin. incredible. He's fa- fucking phenomenal. And the quick thing that we have in the 30 seconds is to take a character who played right for the assignment in 2002 original Spider-Man with a ca- blend of yeah. campy but also villainous enough to yeah. make it a real threat in Spider-Man 2 yeah. to transfer that persona to a modern day 2021 villain movie where yeah. we just had Thanos and Apocalypse yeah. and Magneto but to make it stick really well. All right, we only got 10 seconds left. <laughs> really yes, he, he did an incredible job. Uh, but, but yes, for the onset home, the only play... A about five to ten second brief snippet of the Sam Raimi Spider Man music. Uh, Stuart was very disappointed. Movie was okay. All right. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so Lonely Hearts. So Lonely Hearts. What's uh, the con- what's the post context? How much of this much? How much of this make? <laughs> all the good stuff. Tell me all about what. So happened this movie after- was made for an eighteen million dollar budget. Really, eighteen, which is a Wait. lot cheaper than a lot of the recent Travoltas we've been covering. He's starting period piece too. He's starting to get to a point where he's not drawing the big budgets anymore. But he's still like this is still kind of doing Well, just to think like domestic disturbance, a modern day million. not a period piece. Period piece budgets tend to well, always have to be higher. Yeah. Well, that's why so much of this movie is set in like an office and the exterior of a house. Mm. Cuz they couldn't probably afford anything crazy like in the city or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. I think they go to the city like twice in this movie and it's yeah. like generic wide shots. 75 million domestic disturbance to so, 18 million in this with the cast. The cast that's in this movie versus domestic disturbance, Jeff. Yeah. So, Stuart, I'm going to tell you how much this movie made. Uh, mind you, $18 million budget. In the United States, this movie made $188,000. Whoa! <laughs> wow! Um, this movie made... Uh, the equivalent of like one weekend of Spider-Man in one theater. Wow! <laughs> uh, the rest it made two point three million in the rest of the world. So it <sighs> wasn't even like a hit, but it did make more than a million dollars elsewhere. But that is a paltry, <laughs> paltry gross in the U.S. One hundred and eighty-eight thousand dollars in the U.S. Yes. Wow. Accounting for, I don't know exactly wow. what the uh, the price of a film ticket was. Eighteen million. Would you say dollars? the it's price such... of a movie ticket in like two thousand six was roughly like eight dollars? Because it's been more expensive. Probably more than that. I'm, I'm gonna say eight. Okay. Um. So with that, as that's the equivalent of only twenty three thousand five hundred seventy people seeing this movie in theaters, and we are two of them. Well, in theaters. Oh, right, in theaters. Um. So yeah, not a great success. <laughs> wow. It pulls a 47 on Rotten Tomatoes with only 43 reviews. So a lot of like people didn't even review this movie. Wow. Uh, All right. Abysmal. Yes. Abysmal. Terrible. Both critically and commercially. Cri- like crippling failure. And I think this is... But you know, 18 million failure isn't like as bad as like a $75 million failure. And so here's the thing. This movie kills John Travolta as a serious actor. This is the last to go at it. Really? After this, he's only back to charm movies, and he never does exist like a a real big budget a list drama again. But we keep you keep calling it that. Is this really a big budget a list drama? Eighteen million. Eighteen million is higher than somebody's gonna be working with. In the <laughs> no. But from a domestic disturbance, or seventy five million not, dollars. If not big budget, then. Um, big cast or like it's this seems like a Hollywood production yeah in a sense yeah but this is what kills any chance of like him doing this again in the future 18 million that's only like three more million than like one of the episodes of the show I worked on yeah like that's not that much Mm -hmm. so so after that like that result the fact that he can't even draw a million dollars for people to see this movie that's it yeah because after this, he's only doing his next three movies are Wild Hogs, uh, Hairspray, and Bolt. Which I would Hairspray contend supporting, which very I would be, supporting. What was that? 
hairspray it's like not not just like a well uh, a major supporting role well it's a minor supporting here's the thing role. hairspray which we'll talk about when we cover hairspray it's not a lead role but it is like the marquee role of the of the movie like when people go to like talk about hairspray as a production like a stage production the fact that a man always plays the mom is like the big piece yeah. of casting yeah and so that's still like a star entry point for him but in terms of you know it's a comedy yeah a musical an animated picture which i would contend are three a-list roles yeah um and then they list theirs over and i mean yeah i'm gonna save all the thoughts for our recap yeah. episode so we'll talk about we'll it we'll talk about it but that that's lonely hearts yeah Sayonara, it's, John Travolta. It's sad. <laughs> it's sad. Sayonara, man. Uh, well, I mean, this, watching, this a, watching what... a career implode in real time and knowing it doesn't recover <sighs> is very sad. Well, this is, I want and you know, this isn't as decisive as I think it was because we've been, this has been the trend though. Yeah. Because again, we've had this talk conversation many, many times that like technically John Travolta has like five acts. Yeah. Um, and this is the in between the battlefield Earth p- taking a Pelham one to yeah. react is what we're in right now. Yeah, um, I know we're kind of engulfing the two together to making it one act, but yes, this is like, yeah, he can't rebound from this yeah, anymore. He doesn't. There's nothing to rebound from because he's already done all the rebounds. Mm-hmm. Like, what other copies can you do if you've already done the copies? Yeah. We'll talk. Yeah. We'll talk about this more, and we'll talk about it more next week in our episode on Wild Hogs. Oh boy! Where oh we'll boy. be joined by my dad. Yeah, that's right, Don the, Elmore, the uh, history's great dad movie, Wild Hogs. <laughs> will be joined by an actual father. <laughs> but really, though, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, Wild Hogs is the most dad movie next to a movie we're going to cover in two thousand nine. Which is many, many episodes down the road. You guys aren't going to hear this episode for a while, but it's a little mo- film called Old Dogs. <laughs> <laughs> that is the next <laughs> most dad movie ever. When it's only directed by the same guy, which we'll talk about yes. in that episode that we definitely are recording next. Um, right. <laughs> and then Robin Williams has another major dad. I mean, Robin Williams has a lot of dad movies, yeah. but one of the other one of the ones called RV. So, RV. Yeah. All right. Uh we're good to wrap this up Jeff? yeah i think we're good to wrap it up uh, thank you folks for listening tune in next week for wild hugs please remember to rate review subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on as a reminder we are available on spotify apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, and youtube um you can pop it to our reddit r slash revolting you can uh tweet or instagram us at revolting pod email us any comments or questions revolting podcast at gmail.com find me on twitter at jeff w sweeney Find my lonely heart at Stuart Elmore 95 on Instagram. As always, special thanks to Rebecca Johnson for our graphic design and Michael Van Bodegum Smith for our music. Yeah. Oh, and Nicole Johnson for our social yeah, media. Fuck off. Or, yeah. you know, Nicole. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.